coastal, a small uh, coastal town, a little like Haleiwa, I suppose, mm -hmm. something like that. So it's a very nice, quiet place to live, but very cold in winter because we lose the sun early. Uh, so unfortunately, or fortunately, I'm not in Hawaii leading the uh, retreat, but I am really grateful because of for the technology that allows me to uh, come together with you at least for a few hours of the day. That will be good. And um, I wanted to uh, start with, um, which I did in the first of the Sunday sittings, which we did in, uh, started in June, and we did six Sunday sittings and, and a number from Hawaii joined in on those, Pam and Pat and Pam, um, Barbara and Etsuko came every week and uh, they're really nice, the Sunday sittings. I like them just for an hour or so. And I started with a quote from the Dalai Lama, uh, which I, a friend of mine, this 80-year-old uh, woman who runs an, es uh, who runs an esoteric uh, bookshop in Sydney, every year she gives me a Dalai Lama calendar and uh, she sources it from somewhere and it's absolutely, uh, has fantastic quotes in it. So I'm going to start because I think it's a really important quote. If we, if, if we ourselves wish to contribute to an enlightened world, the way to begin is by cultivating our minds. If we ourselves wish to contribute to an enlightened world, the way to begin is by cultivating our minds. Now, all countries around the world at the moment, including Australia, are going through a very uncertain time at the moment, aren't, aren't we, with the COVID-19. And I want to talk about that a little bit in regard to how the Buddha, uh, the Buddha see this, or view this pandemic and the situation that it's created for all of us. But I think I really like that quote because the Dalai Lama in that quote is reminding us that um, if, we want to be, if we want to contribute to an enlightened world, a world that's free of greed, hatred and delusion, then we need to cultivate the mind. And I think in this uh, time that we're going through at the moment, uh, which uh, seems to be never ending, at the moment, Australia's just had another quite large spike uh, in coronavirus infections. And so, you know, everyone's a little freaked out about that at the moment. But still, you know, if we're able to watch the mind and watch how our minds are reacting to the situations that are assailing us at the moment, then we can remain equanimous and peaceful and contribute to the situation by just being that mindful compassionate kind tolerant etc etc by cultivating the mind so i really love this uh, photo and that's a photo from the calendar of the dalai lama uh, which i love indeed and so i like that very much indeed but the situation that we find ourselves in at the moment i think is um <coughs> really an example of what the Buddha was referring to in regard to uh, dukkha or the unsatisfactory nature of things, the suffering that people are encountering. And especially in a couple of facets because uh, this dukkha is usually divided into three categories. And the first of those, of course, some of you, all of you will know, or some of you will know is dukkha dukkha, which is bodily dukkha. And that's all the uh, bodily uh, problems we may have, whether you kick your toe on a rock, whether you have an illness in some respect, et cetera, et cetera. All the little bodily things that we go through every day. Uh, that's uh, the first kind of dukkha. It also refers in a much greater sense to birth, old age, sickness and death, of course. You know, where we're born and sickness arises and finally we pass over to the next birth. But I think the one that's really, and so there's been a lot of bodily dukkha around, hasn't there? You know, many people, many deaths, many people uh, contracting this disease. But the thing 
or what's happening here now. And I'm sure you've all been through this kind of mental state. I and mean, I certainly did in the beginning. And the second dukkha the Buddha talked about is the unexpected changing nature of things. The unexpected changing nature of things. You know, we have in our mind's eye, you know, in our, because of our ignorance, that things are permanent and not going to change. But unexpected change happens. And in this period of time, due to the COVID outbreak, there's been so much bemusement around. What do I do? What's happening now? People have not been able to put their fingers on what's going on. Oh, I was supposed to be in Hawaii this month, but I'm not. You know, everyone has a plan which hasn't been coming to fruition. Life has changed completely. And it's taken quite a long time, if ever, for people to get used to this change that's going on. So as a yogi and as a person that's seeking or trying to cultivate an enlightened mind, I think this is a really fabulous period of time to be able to watch the mind and see how the mind is attaching, if you like, to what we think uh, is going on. Because we never know. You know. Buddha said that life is uncontrollable. We think we've got it nailed, but it's not the case. Something will happen to change. Well, we change. So the second dukkha uh, is to do with this unexpected change that happens in our lives. And COVID has really been an example of massive change in people's lives. Don't you agree? And can lead to a lot of stress, a lot of frustration, a lot of irritation, until we begin to see this changing nature and accept the changing nature and be patient with what's going on um, as much as we can and to understand this changing nature. And the third of these dukkhas is um, to do with mental formations. And so within, these, within this bodily dukkha and within the dukkha of change, of the unexpected change, we create these mental fo uh, formations or mental fabrications uh, about what's going on. And so this can lead us to great unhappiness or it can lead us to great peace of mind, whichever, whatever our particular attitude is towards it, what we're experiencing. This third dukkha is also to do with the, one of the Burmese monks, uh, Saido Ijanika, used to call it the obsessive nature of change, you know, the deep nature of change. And when one is fully cognizant in one's practice and one's matured enough and is able to gun that insight into change, uh, the unpredictability of change becomes really clear to us in the mind. And so we can go through life with a different attitude towards how things are. Um, I remember in the first few weeks of this COVID in March, uh, that it was uh, completely, oh, I don't know what the word is really. I just felt like bemused for a few weeks. Did you feel like that a little bit? Oh, what to do now? Things were changing so rapidly. You know, our plans, our jobs, our whatever we were doing was all changing. Things had changed completely. But um, gradually over a period of time, you know, Dharma kicked in and the mind was able to settle down with the change and just keep going, I suppose. So in our meditation practice, uh, what we begin to see is this dukkha, these three dukkhas, much more clearly in the mind. And we can let go much more of our attachments to um, our experiences much more easily as well. And so the mind can, by cultivating the mind, the mind can be peaceful. We can be also compassionate for those, uh, those folks out there that are really suffering through this COVID period and just in everyday life situations brought about by the second dukkha and the third dukkha as well. 
So that's what I wanted to talk about tonight. It seemed to be, uh, to me, one of the biggest, um, uh, biggest or clearest, clearest understandings that I was gaining from this uh, COVID thing is this nature of change all the time and how to let go of our expectations of how things should be. Now the Buddha, of course, we're here sitting here now when you know, you're in your home, I'm in my home, we're not in the Zendo in Hawaii and Palolo. And it's, uh, is it more difficult to practice in this situation or is it easier to practice in uh, Palolo? Well, another story that came to mind very, very quickly, because uh, I'm finding I'm really quite enjoying these Zoom sittings you know, because it gives you a chance to practice at home and to also bring uh, mindfulness training into everyday life situations. And I thought about, I hadn't thought about this woman for many, many years. But most of you or some of you will know of uh, Deepama. But it's not Deepama I want to talk about. But there was another woman, woman in Bengali woman, uh, a little bit after uh, Deepama, a little bit younger than Deepama, Deepama, when we lived in India. And uh, she, we used to meet her from time to time, our friends, in Calcutta and sometimes she'd come to Budgaya and teach. And her name was Krishna, Krishna Barua. All these, uh, they're all relatives of Manindra, Manindraji, who some of you will know also. But this woman I thought was really a special being when I met her. And she told, uh, she told her story one day about her Dharma practice. And she told it in a way which was, I thought, really helpful. Uh, she said uh, she didn't have the opportunity to go to a meditation centre. Her teacher was Manindra and Deepama. But she didn't have a chance to go to a meditation centre because um, of, of her husband. You know, in the Indian culture, the husband rules the roost, especially in those days in the 70s, they were still ruling the roost. And he wanted her to stay at home and look after the children and do the cooking and manage the house, etc., etc. And he wouldn't allow her to go. Deepama had the opportunity later in life to go to the Mahasi Centre in Burma, where she practised for three months there. But Krishna didn't have this opportunity. And Menindra said to her, apparently, she said, well, that doesn't matter. You know, Menindra had that kind of, you know, freewheeling uh, way of practice. He said, you know, you have the four foundations of mindfulness, don't you? She said, well, yes, you know, I can observe the body, I can observe the feelings, I can observe, I can observe the mind states that come into the mind and the uh, impacts of the sense doors when stimuli touches the doors. Well, he said, you can practice at home. And she did. And she turned her whole house into a meditation center. And everything she did when she was cooking the dal, when she was looking after her children, when she was going shopping, everything she did, she really applied herself to the activity trying to be mindful of each and every moment. Now, we hear this quite often at the end of Dharma talks, don't we? You know, how to brush your teeth, how to do this, et cetera, et cetera, and try to do it mindfully. But she did it. And within a short period of time, she became an enlightened being just by being mindful in her everyday life situation, paying attention to when she was washing the dishes, washing the clothes, cooking the dal for her husband, making the chai. Whatever she was doing, she tried to utilise the first foundation of mindfulness, expect, uh, especially just being aware of the activity. And then when feelings arose in the body, she tried to, or the mind, she tried to observe those as she was going through the day. The mind states, if she felt bored or depressed or anxious or happy or sad, she tried to notice those. 
And then when sounds would touch or smells, or et cetera, would touch the sense doors, she would try to observe that as fully as possible. And apparently, uh, within a short period of time, as I mentioned, it wasn't very long at all, uh, she became a Sotapanna, or a first stage in practice. And uh, she uh, became uh, good friends with one of my good friends, and she came to uh, Budgaya, and that's where we met her and heard her story. Which is why I think I've always been interested in this on the cushion, off the cushion type of practice because the secret of meditation practice is continuity. If we don't have continuity, we can't build up the necessary uh, degree of mindfulness and concentration, which is available to us, but we're unable because of the gaps in our practice uh, to fully extend and cultivate these uh, minds, uh, this um, way of practice. So we can't go deep enough often. But she showed that she was an example that once one's able to do this uh, fully, um, you know, then it's possible. There's potential in all of us uh, to attain to the highest states of insight uh, with the combination of the four foundations of mindfulness and being able to apply them in everyday life. And I thought that was a wonderful story, don't you think? And, um, you know, gave me a lot of uh, uh, inspiration for uh, later practice. I don't think I ever reached uh, her level of mindfulness in daily life, but still and all, you know, there's been moments when that's, that's um, happened for us. So this Zoom sitting is like reminded me of that. Here we are, we're at home, you know, we're going to get up and do some, we're going to do some sitting, we're going to do some walking, you know, we're going to do a few other things as uh, the day unfolds. And just practicing these uh, four foundations of mindfulness. So how does that sound? You all good with that? Yeah? Okay, good. We try to keep Krishna in mind here. She was a really special woman. I really enjoyed her very much indeed. What is it like, she would say, when she came to Budgai, to bend? What is it like to stretch? What is it like to put your clothes on? Those sort of simple activities are really the key to the meditation practice. It's not just sitting in full lotus trying to watch the rising and falling all the time. It's in all these activities where we build up a no-gap mindfulness. Now, interestingly enough, what does mindfulness mean? Now, that's a good question. There's a lot out there about mindfulness now, isn't there? It's usually given as a definition of paying attention, which is correct. It is paying attention. But before attention, I think one of the real definitions of mindfulness is remembering. Now, it doesn't mean memory. What it means here, this sati, this mindfulness, means it means not to forget what the present moment is that we're experiencing. And if you do, to know that you've forgotten and come back to the present moment experience within any of the four foundations of mindfulness. So remembering, I think, is really the key. In other words, remembering to come back when the mind has drifted off somewhere. You know, knowing that you've drifted off, oh, I've drifted off, I've gone to Disneyland, you know, or out of space or something like this, and then coming back to the present moment experience, whether it's the rising and falling, a sensation, a thought, emotion in the mind, whatever it happens to be, to come back and watching, then paying attention and observing with this uh, great observing power, as Ula Mint would talk about, the great observing power. So remembering, it's really important. So I'd like you to, for this period of time, to try and keep, oh, I've gone off, I've gone to somewhere, right? Let me come back 
you know, it's not that we drag our attention back, but we first have to notice that we've, that we've actually gone off. You know, how long have you gone off? Five minutes, half an hour? One uh, yogi who came and did a three month, uh, not a two month retreat here a long time ago with Sai, Sai Rupandita. He was building a new house. And uh, one day he was uh, having an interview with Saida Upandita, which can be, you know, quite a trial at any given time. And Saida said to him, could you notice the rising and falling? And he kind of jokingly said, which you don't do with Saida Upandita. Oh, no, I was thinking about the furnishings in my house for half an hour or so. And Sidor got really stuck into him. <laughs> no, that's not the way to go. And he said he really got shaken up because he was designing his house. It was going to be the most beautiful house. He'd have this furniture, that furniture, and blah, 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 blah. And he went on and on. And his mind was not on the present moment object. It was thinking about something else. So we don't try not to be like that. You know, we have to say, oh, yes and remember to come back to the present moment object in the meditation. So I think you're all, is that, you okay with this? All good? Yeah. So let's uh, try for a little while with uh, the instruction, of course, in mindfulness practice, in Vipassana meditation practice is uh, very simple actually. Although as we all know, it's extremely difficult to put into practice because of that discursive mind and that mind that wants to wander all the time, hard to tie it down. So if you'd like to uh, settle down now and take a comfortable position, we'll just sit for about uh, 25 minutes to start with because you've been sitting for some time now. If you'd like to just stretch a little bit beforehand, please do that. But be mindful of stretching. Remember Krishna. You know, what am I doing now? I'm stretching. What do I feel now while I'm stretching? Notice what's going on with you. When you go to the Mahasi Center in Burma, uh, the first day or two days of practice there is always on the rising and falling movement of the abdomen. Uh, Mahasi Sayadaw used to call it the basic practice. And so every yogi that came there, um, myself included, we had to practice on the rising and falling. So just for this uh, period of time, as a exercise in remembering to come back let's try and practice with the rising and falling and see how that goes for you you'll notice my well, mind's gone to alamoana shopping center where maybe i'll buy something oh, but no you know just note it come back and just be with the rising and falling. Keep the body quite direct, quite straight, the head just a little dip of the head, the hands in the lap. And relax the mind and body. If you like, take a deep breath or a couple of deep breaths. And just let the mind settle down. What are you doing now? You're sitting. What am I doing now? I'm sitting. For a few moments, just feel the body, become aware of the body. What do I feel within the body? You may tune into the different sensations that are arising and passing away within the body. not holding on to anything, but just watching the changing nature of the sensations.
Mahasi Saido used to give the instruction of just watching sitting, sitting, or noting sitting, sitting, sitting. And there you may start you may start to perceive more clearly the rising and falling movement of the abdomen as you breathe in and breathe out it's the cause for this movement to happen we can watch rising through the from the beginning through the middle to the end as it falls try to watch it from the beginning the middle and the end See if you can, without tightening up around it, see if you can stay there as continuously as possible. If it helps, you can use the mental label of rising and falling. Rising with, concurrently with the rising movement, falling concurrently with the falling movement. If you find your attention drifting off as soon as you can, as quickly as you can, just note drifted and come back to the rising and falling. This movement is very natural. We can notice if it's long or short, light or heavy. Quick or slow. natural breathing, not to change anything, just to observe the changing nature of what it is we're experiencing.
Now we're going to move into just a short period of walking meditation um, to supplement the sitting. But I'd like you to keep in mind um, that little story about Krishna, Krishna Barua, and how she was able to uh, develop a continuity of practice through her everyday life. Of course, she didn't move so slowly throughout the day or she would not have got things done. But even if one can't move, uh, if we just move at a regular pace, we can still be mindful of what we're doing, especially the bodily activities. So, but in uh, intensive meditation retreat, to begin with, we try to slow things down a little bit uh, so we can notice more in more detail uh, what's going on. We can be mindful and then develop a greater awareness through slowing things down a little bit. So I think walking meditation everyone's are familiar with and uh, depending on the condition that you find yourself in, uh, you can walk with the right step, left step or lifting placing or lifting moving placing. Uh, when I first started to practice Vipassana, in 1968 or something, um, I was living in an apartment with uh, a group of Aussies and uh, it was a very small room and I said to the teacher, Thai teacher, I said, oh, how am I going to do this? He said, I use six part. And so I did. I used six part walking because of the situation I found myself in and that proved to be really beneficial. So it doesn't really matter what you do. We work with the conditions that we find ourselves in and allow the natural unfolding, if you like, to happen as time goes by. Sometimes you need to walk more quickly, you know, because of the agitation in the mind, perhaps. It helps to walk more quickly. Uh, other teachers, uh, Sadhu Rajanaka, used to ask you to walk backwards that would really sharpen you up. And imagine you're on the edge of a cliff, coming to the edge of the cliff. And that would really sharpen you up as well. So all kinds of different techniques to, you know, propagate um, mindfulness. But I like the simple technique of just sitting, uh, lifting, moving, placing, or just right step, left step, right step, left step and allow the concentration to build up with the continuity of the mindfulness. So we've tried that as well. So even in these intensive situations, it's useful, right from the uh, sound of the bell when the sitting ends, just to try and keep the attention inside as much as possible. So perhaps standing up, you know, usually will let mindfulness go completely won't we? We'll just stand up, totally unaware that we've stood up till we've stood up. See, oh, we're standing up now. Right? <laughs> but we haven't been aware of the whole process of standing up. We just stood up and find yourself standing up. So try to be aware of that getting up. You know, that's part of the practice that develops this continuity that I'm talking about here. So let's try that now. Have you got a reasonable place to walk in your homes? Is everyone happy with their situation? Okay. I just want you to stand up as mindfully as possible and just note standing for a few moments. Don't begin walking yet, just note standing. Now, can you hear me? Yeah. That's good. So you can stretch a little bit, stretch the legs and stretch the body. You feel the different sensations of standing. What am I doing now? I'm standing. What am I experiencing now? The different sensations in the body. What can I become aware of? 
Now, just to give you a little exercise in bending and stretching. Now we do this countless times throughout the day, but we're not aware of it. We bend and we stretch. So imagine there's something, if you can, the older people like myself may have trouble with this, but imagine you're picking something up from the floor. The first thing you would notice is the intention to bend and then bending and just feel the sensation of bending as you're bending down to pick something up from the floor or the kitchen table, whatever it happens to be. And then bring yourself back again. What do you feel? What do you experience? And possibly you feel movement and then various sensations in the body. It might be painful, it might be not painful, it might be pressure, tingling, whatever it happens to be, stiffness, tightness. Let's do it again. Just bend down as if you're picking something up. You can use a mental label if you like of bending, 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 bending. Like this. But the idea is to become aware of the sensation in the body as you're doing it. Countless times throughout the day, we reach for a doorknob or a sliding door or to get in and out. One of the exercises my teacher gave me in Burma was to note the reaching of the door, reaching for the door. This is another really good exercise. You just feel the sensation, the hand coming up as if you're going to be reaching for the door and turning the knob, opening the door. and then dropping the arm down again. It's surprising how many times you do this throughout the day. Now, of course, throughout the day, we wouldn't do it slowly. We would do it in a natural way. But it's a really good lesson in present moment awareness of what you're doing. Just one or two things like this can really propel the practice to greater heights. And this is what Krishna did. That kind of thing. Now let's move to the walking. And you can choose uh, whichever exercise you would like to do, depending on the space requirements. I think you all know how to do the walking. You start with just being aware of standing. And you want uh, as much space as you have and just try with right step, left step. Right step, left step. Once again, watch how the mind wants to zoom away. Oh, I remember. Mindfulness means to remember. Remember to come back to the present moment object. But without forcing it, you acknowledge, oh, the mind's gone away. And then you bring it back. Right, uh, right step, left step, lifting, placing, lifting, moving, placing, whichever suits you. We'll do this for about 15 minutes. At your own pace, please begin. <laughs> 